sermon today is called Freedom. Freedom. God invented freedom <laughs> for us. Going back to the garden today, we don't usually notice it, but the scriptural account of creation actually agrees pretty well with the theory of evolution. I know you're wondering where I get that idea. Scriptural account of creation, there are two of them, by the way, two, one right after the other, and they're entirely different, uh, and both of them are, I don't know what you call them, masterpieces, uh, treasures of, uh, of, of literature, treasures of scripture, uh, both are glorious. Uh, the first one has a happy ending. God looks at everything he's created and said it's good. And the second one has kind of a sad ending. Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden and God puts a wall around it and puts up a flaming cherub to guard it and a sword that goes back and forth to make sure nobody gets in to get hold of the tree of life and therefore live forever. So... <laughs> Two very different stories, and they are, uh, they are stories. Um, God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being, formed him from the dust of the earth. What's the old story? The scientist uh, who was saying to another scientist, oh, we, can, we can create life now just like God did and using, using basically the dust of the earth. And he took some and started to put it into this machine and he heard a voice that said in a booming fashion, use your own dirt. <laughs> Don't start with what I did. But you know, that is an evolutionary process. It's like a children working with a piece of clay and they pick it up and they start molding it into something, a human being, and along the way it doesn't look like the finished product. I hear people say, well, I don't want to be kin to a monkey. What does the scripture say? We all come from what? Dirt. Choose it. Joe Adams tells, tells this joke about this picture of, of monkeys who are up and some are swinging from a tree and some are uh, walking around and strutting around. And uh, one of the monkeys doesn't have a tail. And the caption on the cartoon said, the one without a tail calls himself Adam. I thought it was funnier than that. I, I, you know, we don't, we don't fight science here. Um, if, if science keeps going in the direction it's going, one thing they're going to run into indisputably is God, because God is there, and God made this whole business through a process that is even beyond what science can understand at present and probably beyond what science will ever understand. And the scriptural accounts of creation are stories, and they are stories, but they contain within them truth. And I'm going to ask you today not to be an eighth grader. When we used to read a story in my eighth grade class, the kids would say, I used to be a school teacher. <laughs> Some of the kids would say, Mr. Brennan, was that a real story? Was that true? I said, no, it wasn't. It was a, it was a story. But, but it is basically true about life, and that's why we're interested in reading. In reading. Well, sometimes if it wasn't like history, they didn't care. I thought so. That never happened. That's not real. When we read the Bible sometimes, we need to know that God speaks to us in stories. Our, our Lord told parables. And sometimes people who dismiss stories also dismiss our Lord's parables. His basic teachings are contained in stories. And this, this is a story. None of us were there through the whole process by which God made the earth. And I must tell you that one of my favorite things in Scripture is the Adam and Eve story. I was in Dallas a number of years ago, well, back in the 1980s, and I saw it in an antique shop. 
Yes, I've been to a few of them. There were two, two panels with a green background, and on this green, they were about this high. I think they were painted on some kind of metal, and they were supposed to be from the 18th century, and they were absolutely beautiful, and one was Adam and Eve. They were meant to go together, and I wanted to buy them to put them here in the church. There were two problems with that. I remember they cost exactly $337, and I didn't have $337. And the second problem was that Eve, well, both of them had strategically placed fig leaves. But Eve needed two more fig leaves than she had. Either that or a bikini or a halter top or something. So even if I could afford to buy them, I don't think I would have had the nerve <laughs> to hang them here in the church until Eve got a little bit of clothing on. We're going to basically read through this story today. This is an old story. This is a pre-Christian story. So we cannot expect the image of God in this story to match entirely the image of God that you and I have in our minds from Jesus Christ. Why? Because there was no image of God before Jesus Christ that was like his image. I want to emphasize the degree to which he changed the world's understanding of God. And this is going to reflect an older understanding. Excuse me. I have a, an uncooperative stool, but I'm going to sit on it anyway. And there are some things in this that we'll want to take with us and celebrate, and there may be some things that we may not want to take with us and celebrate, and that's the way it is when we read the Old Testament, which we should do because it, it contains so much glory and so much beauty there. But we cannot expect of the Old Testament Scripture what we find in the New Testament Scripture, which is why God sent His only Son, our Lord, into the world to... Uh, <laughs> tell us how things really work. But we're going, to have the, we're going to have the joy this morning of reading through parts of this story. And I have put a little thing around on, you've got the scripture there in your bulletin, on sections that we are going to read. And there's just almost something magic about this thing. The, the, the drama is, is, is so perceptible. The beauty of the language, everything. It's just simply a great, great, story. And uh, here we are reading something that's probably 4,000 years old. It was uh, put down on paper or parchment maybe 35, 36, 3700 years ago, but it's older than that. And originally it was told around campfires because every people in the world have wanted to know where did we come from? What are we doing here? What's this all about? And all of them have these stories that, that tell them who they are. They even had questions like, you know, hey, why don't snakes have legs like the other animals? Okay? This story helps, <laughs> tells us why snakes don't have legs. Now, that's not actually why snakes don't have legs in the evolutionary process, but it's a real good story about why snakes don't have legs. We'll start with that second little section. Now, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Skipping down to the next part. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Excuse me, I lost my place. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. 
Well, that's that's a that's a fair warning. You will certainly die. Now, I think I'm not in the habit of giving God advice, but I think the best way to keep Adam from eating from the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil would have been to what? You tell me. What? Just don't put them there. Just don't put them there. Don't give people a choice. So here's one of the wonderful things about this story. We see the invention of freedom. This is really what this whole earthly experience is all about. Freedom. I'm sorry Rihanna's not here to sing it. Freedom, freedom. She didn't so up, show up at the Democratic National Convention this week either. Freedom. That's what this is all about. But God does put them there and says, okay, Adam, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> don't you touch that. It's kind of like putting a big piece of Hershey's chocolate on the coffee table and telling the three-year-old, now there it is right there in front of you, but don't you dare lay hand on that chocolate. And I'm going to leave the room right now. And <laughs> we're going to see what happens. <laughs> and if I come back and you ate that chocolate, I'm going to be real mad. <laughs> well, a kid can take a little anger from a parent. Skip to the next part. The fall. Oh, there's an ominous sounding thing. I wonder who fell. Now, but in the meantime, by the way, between those two scripture readings, God has made woman from a spare rib. Yes, Adam evidently had one extra. And the beauty of this is, man comes from woman. Woman comes from man. And Adam said, when he saw Eve, here she is, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Now, the serpent <laughs> was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, yes, we have a talking snake. Okay, remember. This is a story, and it is an old story. And you and I in this moment are listening as though we are children. And the snake says to the woman, by the way, there's no mention of Satan here, no mention whatsoever. It is the snake. It is a part of creation, the temptation. Saying that it's Satan is a later interpretation. Here, it is a talking snake who is clever and sneaky, and a little bit vile. And if you've ever met any snakes, you know what I'm talking about, okay? That's exactly what a snake is. Now, <laughs> did God really say to you, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. The snake said, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, the assumption of this story is that God does not want us to know good from evil. Where were you born? Yes. Where? In America? Get more specific. What city? 
Port Arthur. Where were you born? Keith. Waterloo, Iowa. Waterloo, Iowa. Child on the front row. <laughs> Where were you born? Dallas, Texas. That's not far away from here. We could go all and say, that's where you come from. I have some things around my house, and if you look on the bottom of the, on the, bottom of the dish, it'll say, made in China. Ah, uh, made in India. Okay. Made in Chicago. Made in USA. If we were stamped, we would have a stamp on us that said, not made in Port Arthur or Dallas, it would say made in heaven. We are there before we are here. And here's what I want us to understand. God sends us here deliberately with a purpose. Now, the understanding of the church throughout ages is that God has made a mess. This world is a mess. This world is fallen. This world is evil. Nothing turned out the way God wanted it to. God just simply got let loose of it somehow. It got away from him. It, he didn't have control of it. Don't you believe a word of that? Ain't nothing in the world ever gotten away from God. God has never failed at any endeavor. And I believe God actually wants us to know good from evil, right from wrong. God wants us to be aware. Before we're born, we are like a new soul there in heaven. And we are not tested. We haven't had the chance to grow. We haven't been challenged with anything. We haven't faced any difficulties because there are no difficulties in heaven. We haven't even learned to love under difficult circumstances because there are no difficult circumstances in heaven. So God, deliberately, with love aforethought, sends you and me into this world Hmm. which ain't always easy, which has all kinds of difficulties waiting for us. And in this world, God has given us freedom. Freedom. The thing this scripture says God invented for us. Freedom. Let's read on. Snake says, you will know good and evil. The woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. There's a line from the New Testament that said of John the Baptist or someone, he grew in grace and understanding. That's what we're here for and gaining wisdom, and she took some of it and ate it. <laughs> she was a generous girl. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. But Eve didn't make quite enough fig leaves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, because who doesn't like to walk in the garden in the cool of the day? And this image of God here, well, you know, this scripture says that God made man in his image, and there is a great, to a great extent, we tend to make God in our image, and that's okay. Remember in the near-death experience I shared with you last week, this woman said that her word from God, the first thing he told her when she said to him in her near-death experience, she was, she was basically dead for a few minutes, she said to God, who are you? He said, I am the original of which you are 
the image. So, God is acting like man here and walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Where are you, Adam? Adam answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I was here. And this is us now. We're in this world. We feel guilt. We feel shame. And sometimes we're even afraid to go before God. This gets us pretty well. And God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, well, the woman you put here with me, you know, <laughs> the woman, well, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. <laughs> and then the Lord God turned to the woman and said, what is this you have done? And the woman said, you know, the serpent deceived me <laughs> and I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals, and you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And he will crush your head and you will strike his feet. And then to the woman he said, well, these are powerful words. I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. God, God didn't say that's the way it ought to be. This is part of the curse, you understand. It got to the point in the 19th century where we 19th century where we had anesthesia. And childbirth did not have to be so painful. But there were a lot of men, preachers especially, who said, you should not give women anesthesia during childbirth. God intended them to hurt because of what women did to us men. Okay, there are some things we, we do not need to take from Scripture because they're far from what our Lord taught us. What he's talking about, though, is just life. He tells the man you're going to have to work the sweat of your brows. You're going to have to toil and you're going to plant seed and you're going to have thistles come up in your garden. And life's going to be rough. And God knows life is rough. But we're not really cursed. This story puts it in the form of a curse, and it may feel like a curse. Believe me, when I get up in the morning and try to stand up on all my knees, both of my knees, I feel like somebody cursed me. Okay? They don't work like they used to. That's why I'm sitting down to do my sermon. I'm not cursed. You're not cursed. How do I know? Because there's somebody who's going to come along later who has the full answer, who has the absolute truth, the whole truth. Someone who comes from God, who was, for all practical purposes, God, God's self, here, among us. And this one said, you're not cursed. You are blessed. You may be hungry, but you are blessed. You may be weeping now, but blessed are those who weep, for they will laugh. You may be persecuted now, but you are blessed for you will rejoice.
Let's leave this old thing behind. The idea that the world is a horrible place. The truth is, and the, I bet I'm the first person to ever say this to you, but I plan to say it again sometime. The world, even with all of its sorrow and all of its pain in both of my knees, the world is exactly what God intended it to be. And, the, and this scripture is right about something, something very important. It is because of this freedom that we have that we have all of this. It is because of this knowledge of good and evil and knowledge of, of what's going on that we know this. But is, is, it is God's intention, his purposeful intention for us, for you and for me, his intention rooted in his deep love for you and for me. It is God's intention that we be here in this place where life can be a struggle and love can be hard. And we are here to learn to love and to find God. Paul told us in that great speech to the Athenians, he said, listen, you've been placed here in this world so that you can feel around, feel around in the darkness, in the difficulty. You can feel around, that's his words, and find God. But Paul says, let me tell you something. God is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And he said, God has now sent his son into this world who has died and risen again so that you may know who God is. At the end of this story, this glorious story, and don't let anything I say make you understand that it is not glorious. It is our treasure. It is in our Bible. It is glorious. But at the end of this story, to keep people from getting eternal life also along with this knowledge of good and evil. God builds a wall around the garden and he puts a gate there and he puts that sword at the gate and the flame cherub with the, with the flame to guard against anyone entering in. And the truth is the ancient Hebrew people did not believe in eternal life as you and I know it. Oh, they had something like Sheol, where when you died, you were gathered with your family. But there was no joy there. There was no laughter there. There was no real life there. Life was only in this world. And this is what they believe. And then we get to our Lord who tells us that it is God's will that you know that we all live forever. And nothing can take that life from us. Our Lord said, don't even worry about somebody who can take your life, who can kill you. Because the truth is they can't kill you. We are permanent. We are forever. And we have this extraordinary experience of living in this world. At the service from for Julie Maxwell, not long ago, Blake sang the most beautiful version I've ever heard of the old Louis Armstrong song, It's a Beautiful World. And I know if you're hurting right now or somebody that you love is hurting, it does not feel so beautiful. But the truth is, God is here with us in our midst. And beyond the suffering, there is his grace and his glory and his power. Don't be fooled. This is God's world. And it is here for you and me. And God is using it in our lives.
Now here's the hard part. In my sister's class on near-death experiences, we've been reading those uh, NDEs. And in those NDEs, people have a whole life review where they see their whole life start up until the time they momentarily kick the bucket, you know, heart stopped. These are only people who have come back that we're hearing from. And there is usually someone's, there's always someone standing beside them, and they say something like, now, show me what you've done <laughs> with your life. And then the life review starts. I don't know whether I look forward to that or not. All of us face a great decision in life. To what extent are we going to let God in? That's the big, big, big decision. When we're feeling around, do we find him? Even though he's always close to us. Back in the 1940s, early 1940s, there was a soldier named George Ritchie, and he died in a hospital out in the camp in West Texas, in Amarillo, I think it was. And uh, <laughs> he was standing behind his bed, and his body was on the bed, and he was confronted by Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ had a question for him. What have you done with your life? And he had that life review, and he thought, well, I was an Eagle Scout. And then he thought, well, that glorified me. And he saw a lot of other things that he was proud of, but mostly they made him look good. And after the life review, Jesus had another question. What have you done to tell people? about me and for the rest of his life George Ritchie told people about Jesus I assume we've all made that decision but do we make it every day and do we know how important it is to live for him? Gracious Lord, we will follow you knowing that whatever difficulties we face right now, the difficulties endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning and always however we feel we are safe and all that we love are safe in your grace we know that you will never let us down or let us go hold on to us lord and help us to hold on to you. Amen.